Country music works its way into the hearts of people long before Nashville and its bright lights. Its stories were first told in the churches, on the front porches, in the homes and places of people sitting around picking and singing. It began in the rural South, in the hills and valleys of West Virginia, Oklahoma, Texas, in small towns with names like Mariana, Natchez, Pie Town, and in cities like this one, Shreveport, Louisiana. In fact, that's where I was born. My daddy, Hank Williams, was playing on a show called the Louisiana Hayride. That was back when country music artists were called hillbillies and TV stood for Tennessee Valley. Daddy made history on the Louisiana Hayride, but so did a lot of others who came to radio station KWKH in the late 40s and 50s. Folks started calling the Hayride the Cradle of the Stars. The halls of the old municipal auditorium are silent now, but their shadows remember a past filled with Saturday night performances by Webb Pierce, Farron Young, Slim Whitman, Elvis Presley, and Johnny Cash. The magic fiddle of Dauber Johnson, the crying steel guitar of Hoot Rains, and Floyd Kramer's rolling piano chords. It's a story about good days and those that saw a lot of tears. It's a tale that takes place in the years following the Second World War, when many people were ready to hope again. It's about dreams that came true and some that didn't. It's the story of the Louisiana Hayride. It's time to remind you that in the Arklatex in the central time zone, the time is now 8 o'clock. The Louisiana Hayride! <laughs> originating once again from the City Auditorium in Shreveport, Louisiana, with a whole host of your favorite country music stars. No one expected it to be more than just a country music radio show, but it was. The Louisiana Hayride was a star maker. It built hundreds of careers in country music, more than any other show of its kind. The hayride started at one of those times in history when all the ingredients are ripe for something to happen. Let's look at it this way. There was no TV. And it was the important thing to do in this area, in this part of the country, was to go to the Louisiana Hayride on Saturday night or to tune it in on the radio and sit around and watch the radio and listen to the Louisiana Hayride on a Saturday night. It was the only thing to do. It was the only ball game in town. There is a, a chemistry of music in that part of the country that you do not find anywhere else. It's a blend of, of Cajun, country, blues, pop, all of the ingredients are there. And uh, we had some great, great talent came there. Well, if the Opry was the promised land for country musicians on their way up, then the Louisiana Hayride was Heaven's Gate. They flocked to it, carrying guitars, fiddles, and songs, looking to make some money and a name for themselves, hoping for that one big hit that might mean a recording contract and the move to Nashville. They were kind of like a training ground for Grand Ole Opry, you know. They'd make the star out of them, and then the Grand Little Opera would grab them. There was a rivalry there, certainly was. And uh, they would send someone down here every Saturday night to see who was making it and who was going to be the next big star of the Louisiana Hayride. And if they could, they wooed them away and took them back up there as soon as they could by giving them a contract for recording or signing them to the Opry or whatever it took. Well, yes, there was competition, but the Hayride's first show was in 1948 almost 25 years after the Opry went on the air. The Hayride had a healthy respect for its older cousin, but the Louisiana show never advertised itself as a stepping stone to the Opry. It had its own reputation, and that was enough to keep its Saturday night roster filled. The Hayride was a steady job, a rare piece of good fortune for anybody trying to make a living 
playing music. But many of the major stations, like WLS Chicago, they had a WLS barn dance. Of course, Nashville had the Grand Ole Opry, the Old Dominion barn dance in Wheeling, West Virginia. There was a show at Chattanooga, and uh, a later a show in Dallas called the Big D Jamboree. So there was nothing innovative about a Saturday night live show. They had been going on for years. We were able to put them on simply because many of your major stations had live acts every morning in the studio. And you had six or eight acts, perhaps, going on consecutively in the mornings, and they would go out at night, make personal appearances in the area, and then they'd come back in the morning for a studio show. So you had talent, you had good talent, that could be gotten comparatively inexpensively. The Hayride had it all. Gospel, live bands, comedy, men singers, and girls. But it had something else that made it stand out. Made it different from the other barn dance radio shows. A certain spirit that had a lot to do with its success. The show experimented with drums, singing styles, fancy guitar licks, and honky-tonk. It was daring, and it got away with it. KWKH went on the air in 1925. Its signal reached most of East Texas, Southern Arkansas, and Northwest Louisiana. Station owner W.K. Henderson learned right off that folks in his rural neighborhood had at least one thing in common. They liked the music they understood. So he gave his listeners country, and his commercial sponsors loved him for it. I'm in Early morning country music shows got to be so popular on KWKH that the station added on a live Saturday night show. It wound up being a dress rehearsal for the Hayride. At KWKH, prior to World War II, in the middle 30s, we had a group of acts, um, the Blackwood Brothers, the original Blackwood Brothers, when there was a father and three sons. We had uh, Hoke and Paul Rice, the Arizona Ranch Girls, uh, the Sunshine Boys, many, many acts of that type. And we began a show, we being Cato B. Cage, a show in the Municipal Auditorium in Shreveport about 1936 called the Cato B. Cage Saturday Night Roundup. B.G. Robertson was in charge of the commercial department, the selling department, and he kind of took me under his wing and taught me what to do and how to do and why. And I don't know who made the decision to start the KWK Saturday Night Roundup, probably BG, but I was the announcer of it. He, in essence, was the producer, but I was the announcer. And we ran that from the from about 36, 37, up to the beginning of World War II. And then we closed it simply because most of the people on it went in the service, including me. When the war ended, KWKH picked up where it left off, but with a few improvements. Its signal was boosted to 50,000 watts, stretching its neighborhood clear out to the California coast. The old Saturday night roundup needed some changes too. A new cast, some big Nashville acts maybe, and a new name. We'd like to invite all of our good neighbors to visit with us tonight at the Louisiana Hayride. The Bales Brothers in our group and all the other acts you hear on KWKH will be there. Program starts We had the, a very good friend at WSN, the Randall Lopper, Dean R. Upson, and uh, he had helped us an awful lot in many ways while we were there. Uh, and we liked him, and he liked us. And he was leaving uh, WSM and going to Shreveport, Louisiana. They were really popular. Bales Brothers, they had tunes like Dust on the Bible, I Want to Be Loved. And they was really setting the woods on fire. We were on the Grand Ole Opry in 1947, Johnny and Jack and the Tennessee Mountain Boys. Dean Upson, he was down at KWKH, the commercial manager at KWKH, and I called him and I said, Dean, I hear the Bales brothers are doing real good down there. How would you like to have another act like Johnny and Jack and the Tennessee Mountain Boys and Kitty Wells? He said, I would love it. Well, I bowed my head. When they started to start to lose on a hayride, all they did, they got the auditorium on Saturday night, then they would bring each one in for a little program on Saturday night, and they would advertise it during the week, and they had a ready-made audience that would come out to see the lose on a hayride. The following was there for country music.
The all-new Louisiana Hayride kicked off April 3rd, 1948. KWKH depended on its morning show talent, just as it did to get the roundup off the ground. Their popularity guaranteed eager sponsors and a packed house at the Municipal Auditorium on Grand Avenue every Saturday night. But those country music acts had to travel a lot of roads and entertain at a bunch of hoedowns, schoolhouses, and barbecues to make it happen. It was plenty tough. It was practically, you, you almost starved. It was hard to make a living. It was, uh, it wasn't, uh, they looked down on music then. They called it hillbilly music. And uh, it wasn't recognized as really a, a the force it was, because they figured like there was really uh, real poor people and uh, sorry people. That, that, that was the impression that they had. It was the, the type of people that were in it, and it was the, the image that we had to the public wasn't good back then. You eat out of cafes and live out of suitcases and what to have you, you know. And it, it got rough sometimes, no sleep. Sometimes you might get in there in time enough to shave and shower before a job, and sometimes you wouldn't. I've seen a lot of times that <laughs> we'd play a place and come away with nothing uh, after we paid for the advertising and the gasoline to get there. I remember one time that uh, we were going into a town and uh, we put the last gas in the car, the last money we had for gas in the car, and it just happened that this town sat down in the valley and we got up on top of a hill I ran out of gas, but coasted right down, <laughs> coasted right down in front of the place we were supposed to play, and then got enough money that night, got enough money that night to get to get some gasoline and a bite to eat. <laughs> it was a hard day. It was rough days. Radio was changing that. These hillbilly songs about lost love, hard times, and hungry hours. These tunes about hell raising, romance, and just getting by. They were being sung in living rooms everywhere. The hayride acts worked hard to replace hillbilly with country. They made it easier for people like my daddy to cross over. Hank Sr. was working the Old South Alabama circuit for years before he came to Shreveport for a shot at the big time. They were having packed crowds before Hank Williams got there, but they didn't have a real big star. They didn't have an idol. They didn't have anybody that could, that people could idolize, you know. Could scream and run and wait for hours. When Hank come in there and got such a tremendous impact, he began to get lots of the people that like other kinds of music. When he hit so big, like the people that was raised and would, would admit that they liked country music, you'd see them down at the right on Saturday night, but it, it was Hank Williams. and it, it really did. I, I would say that, that that was the impact that began to make it a national recognized show. If my daddy changed the show, well, the Hayride changed Hank Williams, too. The Shreveport days were a fresh start for him. The money was good, and show dates were regular and steady. Folks who worked with him then say he didn't drink as much as he did before or as much as he did again later. If he made a date in Tyler, Texas, Texarkana, or Baton Rouge, his fans weren't disappointed. It was his reputation as a singer and a songwriter that was growing. Al Hank was just a Montgomery, Alabama country boy, and he never tried to be or pretended to be anything else. But he had an intensity about him, and when he would sing, he would lean into the microphone and get very intense, and it kind of drew you to him. It made you a part of the song, because he felt those songs, and you knew he was feeling them. His voice indicated he was feeling them. And Hank, in his way, was definitely a genius. He wrote the vast majority of the songs that he recorded. They all rhymed. They were poems. He loved to sing. I mean, you hand him a guitar and sit down, you know, he'd, he'd entertain you as long as you'd... <laughs> yeah, we've stayed up many a night. We've stayed up till daylight. After the Louisiana Hayride, we'd, we'd go out to our house over at Johnny Bale's place, and we'd all just sit and pick till daylight. When he came over there and he would hump down kind of over that microphone and lean into it, and he'd say, that big old white hat, he'd say, howdy, folks. He said, me and my wife, Miss Audrey, had the biggest fight last night. And he said, boy, it's hurt me all day today. And I wrote this song, and I'm going to sing it to Miss Audrey and you. Why they come out of them seats, cry, they loved it. 
Just a few months after he came to the hayride, Daddy started singing an old pop song called Lovesick Blues. I got a feeling of the blues. That song took off to the tops of the Billboard and Cashbox popularity charts. It sure gave announcer Ray Bartlett a reason to kick up his heels. It was the best advertisement the Hayride ever had. The first night that Hank sung the Lovesick Blues, he didn't have his band with him, and Dobber Johnson uh, playing the fiddle and Felton Pruitt on the steel and Buddy Attaway on the electric guitar, and I was on the bass fiddle. I remember he sung it in Elf, and he was rehearsing it in the dress room, the one that's upstairs back there. And he just started singing the thing. I said, Hank, who in the world wrote that song? He said, Rex Griffin did. I said, man, that thing got a chord in there. I can't figure out where he's going. But anyhow, I really couldn't see where he would do it. But when he would do that yodel, uh, he would, uh, when he'd do to break his voice, he'd wobble his knees kind of when he did that. And then Ray Bartlett would get kind of underneath the stage and jump up and turn flips and everything when the Hank could do that. Yodel, the roof would come in. I mean, on the air, it sounded like the greatest thing. And everybody in the country had to go down there to see what was causing all the commotion. He could just win over a crowd. And when he'd start doing that love sick blues, he'd, he'd, he'd kind of start wiggling around there and getting all kind of, he's, he made the remark that, that uh, I don't see, I don't think they like the tune so well as they like to see me get tied in a knot trying to sing it. He'd have to do that love sick blues for three and four and five times before he, they'd let us off the stage, you know, before they let him off. Sing it so much, sometimes he'd forget it. He'd turn around to me and want to know what the words. I'd say, I don't sing them, I just play them. Love Sick Blues was Hank Williams' ticket to Nashville. He left the hayride after less than a year on its stage. But like old friends do, Daddy never said goodbye. And three years later, he came back. Yeah, I got one that I'd like to sing that I wrote about Louisiana when I was down here a few months, a few years ago at least. All right. Little thing called jambalaya and the crawfish. When Hank's drinking got so bad that it was obvious that the operator was going to have to terminate him, he had already been talking with me for weeks about coming back to the hayride. And it was arranged, and he called me and said, can I come back? I said, sure, come on. And he came back to the hayride and signed a contract to appear on the hayride for three years on Saturday nights. And it had two and a half years to go at the time of his death. He came to Nashville and he just set this whole world on fire. He was the first one to go to Las Vegas, the country singer. He was the first one in a major hotel in New York City to work. He opened a lot of doors for us. <clears throat> of course, he closed a lot of them for us later on in his career when he really got into the trouble with his boozing and his personal life and all. But when Hank got into his own personal problems, it later on, you know, just completely ruined him in a, in a way in the industry. It didn't ruin the love the people had, but it, it, it hurt him from the booking standpoint. Bookers wouldn't take chances on it because they knew if they booked him, they could have an auditorium full, and Hank, one time out of 10, might show up. He was in so much trouble personally. They had made an addict of him anyway when he fell off that horse and hurt his back and they started giving him morphine. So Hank suffered. I know, I've seen him laying the floor on his back and tears run out of his eyes from hurting his back. That's a sad thing. For somebody just the people that don't know, say, oh, he died a dope addict. Well, that ain't really true. He died a sick man. I saw him when he left and when he came back. And, uh, you know, the word was out all over the world that Hank Williams was fired from the Grand Ole Opry, the greatest radio show in the world. And he came back, and I saw him encore seven times when he came back. And he said, I've come back to my people down here in Louisiana. And they loved him. Now I saw him when he was drunk, and they still loved him. Because he was real. He wasn't phony. Shreveport made Daddy into a country music superstar, and his success focused the national spotlight on the hayride. The KWKH audience grew even wider after 1949. New talent replaced some of the show's pioneers who moved on to other opportunities. But before the big turnover of talent, the hayride became part of the legend, and the dream of making it was on a lot of people's minds. The other night when I came home so drunk I couldn't see. Red Savine inherited Hank's Johnny Fair syrup radio spot 
and soon had fans coming to the hayride just to see him. A bottle of gin and I didn't have no more. The cap flew off when I fell down and spilled it all. But the hayride fans chose another singer to fill the show's reputation as a star maker. I lingered down in Mexico and Madison. Webb Pierce described his style as just a country boy singing his heart out. He knew he was going to make it. Webb was a uh, manager of the Sears men's uh, section, men's department. Webb couldn't get on the Louisiana Hero. They wouldn't let him on the Louisiana Hero. And Webb was playing local honky tonks and, you know, and outdoor shows. And he'd say, One of these days, son, I'm going to be on the Louisiana Hero. You wait and see. You wait and see. Then finally, I got to know Horace Logan and kept telling him I, he needed me on the Louisiana Hay Ride, and he kept telling me I was an amateur. And, uh, but finally, he says, I'm going to put you on there and show you. And when you go down there and sing that Hay Ride, you're singing among professional entertainers. And he said, I'm going to show you, let you go out there and find out for yourself just how bad you are and how good they are. It was so obvious to me that he was going to do something. He was going to do something or kill himself, one or the other. He was just that determined. There was a guitar player, a staff man named Buddy Attaway. And he paid Buddy Attaway to be sick so he could play guitar. And uh, so what he was playing, and he, Webb Pierce can't play. He plays guitar like I do, bad, awful. And so when he got the opportunity, he just jumped in front of the microphone and started singing. So I went out there and stole the show from all of them. And he said, hey, you better come back next Saturday night. And that's the way it started. People I worked with at Sears when I started on there. Uh, I know one lady was a very nice lady, you know, and she says, uh, Webb, you should go have you go to a training school and have your voice trained. And uh, I said, uh, have it trained? Yeah, so you can sing smooth and like these big stars. I said, I don't want to sing like them. I want to sing like me. She said, well, you know, you just, uh, you don't sound like the others. I said, I don't want to sound like the others. You know, they thought everybody's supposed to sound like Crusoe, I guess. But this was country music. True to legend, Webb followed the trail east to Nashville, but he left behind a legacy of his own. More than any other artist, Webb was quick to give the new kid a break. At one point, Webb's band consisted of Goldie Hill, as a girl singer, she's Mrs. Carl Smith, uh, Tommy Hill, her brother, as lead guitar, Farron Young, as a front man and soloist, uh, Jimmy Day on steel and Floyd Kramer on piano. Wasn't a bad band, was it? And Webb decided he wanted a girl singer. And he said, we ought to get a girl for the band. And Tommy said, well, I've got a little sister at home. He said, you want to give her a try? And he said, why not? And he called me, and he said, you want to sing? And I said, sure. I call the Louisiana Hayride my school of hard knocks because we worked the road during the week and worked there on Saturday night. And we didn't make a lot of money. You know, I don't guess anyone did, even the stars so to speak. It wasn't a big money situation, but it was a stepping stone. Of course, I started trying to write some country songs then, and I went over and knocked on his door, and I told him I had some songs I wanted to hear, and I came in, he let me in, and I sang them to him. And we have said, well, son, you sing a lot better than you can write. So I did, that was a compliment to him, but it, and I thought, well, goodness, you know, I, I didn't think of myself singing. I, did, I couldn't ever see myself as a professional singer making any money. And I thought, well, I'll be a songwriter. But he changed my ideas around so well, you better sing. Old Farron left Dairy Farming and hit the road with the rest of Webb's band. That family saw a lot of miles before they all made it to Nashville. We went to one date one time right across the line over in Texas. I advertised it. We went down to do the show, and there was no electricity in the school at all. And they had lamps in it, had coal oil lamps. Of course, we had nowhere to hook up the steel guitars and things. 
and no PA system. But we were very lucky because the auditorium didn't hold about 50 people. And there was about 10 in there. And it was, <laughs> and it was on the ground floor. And it was about 40 of them looking in the windows, you know, looking around. But <laughs> And Webb, Webb made a, a, a bad mistake because he told everybody outside, well, if y'all want to see the show, just come on in. Well, those 40 came in with the 10 that was in there. It paid. <laughs> we had to give them their money back, which was like a quarter or something. A piece. But it was funny. Those were, they, were, they weren't easy days. One thing we always had on the old Louisiana Hayride was a variety of music. All of the soloists were encouraged, those who could afford it, to have their own band so they'd have a different sound, a sound of their own. And the Hayride always had at least two different backup bands. One, usually straight country band, featuring Buddy Attaway and Dauber and a few of the others. And another, a kind of an uptown band with Preacher on the piano or Floyd Kramer on the piano or some of the others with more of a modern country sound so they could back the various soloists on the show. Let's listen now to the old Louisiana Hayride band as they play the Yarn Blossom Special. <laughs> Well, I think maybe having the chance to work with uh, many different artists at that time with the different styles of music uh, gave me more of a creative uh, situation to my music. And uh, was basically, I grew up with country and rhythm and blues. And it gave me more of a chance to really stretch out and play different types of music, pop music and uh, jazz, as well as country and rock. James Burton and I uh, were experiment with guitar sound, uh, the thin strings, the steel picks, uh, more bends uh, uh, from a blues nature, but still country music, uh, and rock, the mid-50s rock. We were experimenting with all of that, and uh, even if it was a country sing, we would throw these licks in there, and we found the audience loved it. <laughs> The early 1950s were growing years for many musicians and artists, and the Hayride grew with them. The cast took on new faces. David Houston, Sonny James, Tommy Trent, Jumpin' Bill and the rest of the Carlisles, and from New Mexico, Billy Walker. To realize that you're gone. Then the Hayride really got hot. It joined the CBS National Network and the Armed Forces radio system picked up the signal and sent it all over the world. Saturday night, 8 o'clock, millions tuned in to that live Hayride sound. The CBS Radio Network presents the Louisiana Hayride. Just before we hit the air, as the second hand went right up to the 60, I'd say, is anybody here from Texas? And since most of our audience was from Texas, the place would literally explode and Jack would turn it wide open, and we'd hit the air with this tremendous blast of sound. And as it faded a little bit, I'd say, the Louisiana Hayride, and it started to do deep, 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 and start the theme. We never explained to the broadcast audience what we were doing. A gospel quartet would be singing, say, cool water. We'd bring them cups of water, each man holding two, both hands full of water. Then we'd bring the entire water jug out, and the audience would go into hysterics. We never explained on the air what we were doing just the incredible hysteria that was going on in the audience. And we did have microphones hanging throughout the auditorium so the applause could become as much a part of the program as the music coming from the stage. And the greatest. Let's give a wonderful round of applause. Don't let him quit. Johnny Horton, let's go! Tillman Franks, when he managed Johnny Horton, was also teaching a little group of students the guitar. And what he would do on a Saturday night, he'd get all his students, and he'd, he'd get them to sit all over the auditorium in different places. And then when Johnny came on, they would start applauding in their particular area. And of course, you know, they'd get everybody around them applauding. If you did something well, then, I mean, it'd stand up and, and let you know they liked you. 
They're quick to encore you if you were good. And yet, if you were bad, <laughs> nobody, nobody crucified you. You know, the audience didn't take any prisoners, let's say. <laughs> or we'd all be prisoners. It was show business. It was designed to cause the people to be curious to want to come see the thing. That was the whole idea. The announcers were the glue that held it all together. Since he was the show's producer, Horace Logan was kind of the big daddy of them all. He, Ray Bartlett, and Bill Cutterback were there first. Frank Page was around almost as long. Hi Roberts, Norm Bale, and Jeff Dale signed on next. But the announcer that caused the biggest stir wasn't really an announcer at all. He was hired as one, but coming from Texas, he had much bigger plans. One night, uh, Sleepy LeBeth failed to show. And uh, so we asked Jim, you know, hey, you want to sing a couple? And we need a fill in. And Jim said, sure. So he sang a couple of songs, and that's what started it all. It was an accident that Jim Reeves uh, sang on the Louisiana Hayride and got his start on the Hayride. I'm gonna get red-eyed and rowdy, gonna tell everybody howdy, gonna go... Jim always had in mind and knew the direction that he was going, and he was probably as well organized and uh, and saw ahead further than some of the other artists that I had known well and grew up with. He had everything lined out pretty well, and he was fortunate enough to later to start recording those tremendous ballads and develop that style that he and R.C. Gay developed after 1955 when he came to the Opry and joined R.C.A. Fifty-seven, when he recorded uh, Four Walls, he just decided that song just fit singing in an intimate voice directly to a person instead of millions of people, one person. And uh, so he, that way he got to be his natural self and it worked. Jim Reeves uh, uh, died not ever fully knowing or realizing his capability or just how popular and how good he was. Jim Reeves' smooth style did a lot to create the country pop sound of the 60s. Just before Jim left the hayride, the Maddox brothers and Rose joined the show. Rose and her brothers lit up the place just by what they had on. And when that Alabama lady started singing, where the place got its first taste of what rockabilly was all about. Rose got the hayride ready for what was coming next, and what was coming made everything else that came before seem pretty tame. down and got Elvis into the auditorium and I watched him as they set up and rehearsed a little bit. And I knew that he wasn't country, but I also knew that he was really innovative. This is different. My gosh, this is something. It seemed like yesterday and he was wearing a pink coat, black pants and white shoes, uh, which was a, a definite giveaway that this guy must be a little different, you know, than, uh, than the other people that you were going to see on, that night on the stage. His first appearance, they had told him not to use any vulgar movements. And Elvis Elvis was nervous, and he just stood out there. And so the second appearance, he didn't do much. And 
when he come over to me, I was in the corner, him and Scott and Bill, and they, they couldn't understand why they didn't tear the roof down because they'd been doing it at the Eagle's Nest in Memphis for Sleepy Eye John up there where he's been buried. And everywhere he goes, people go wild and he didn't do it. And I said, well, don't pay no attention. I said, do anything you want to out there. What can they do to you? I think he built it here and helped build it. I mean, they, it was already a big monumental show as it was. I think by him just being there attracted more people. In the middle of 1955, Elvis hired Colonel Tom Parker as his manager and signed another one-year contract with the Hayride. After the Memphis Splash was on national television several times, Elvis and the Colonel figured they could do better without having to come back to Shreveport every Saturday night. KWKH charged Elvis $10,000 to get out of his contract early and made Elvis do one last concert. It was held at the Fairgrounds Coliseum, the only place big enough to hold 9,000 screaming teenagers. Elvis was a hard act to follow, but a lot of guys tried. Merle Kilgore was one of them. His real fame came as a songwriter. One of his tunes was co-written with June Carter and recorded by a young singer on the Sun label in Memphis. Johnny Cash came to the hayride looking lean and hungry, riding the waves of Elvis Presley's thunder. To a great extent, he was overshadowed. People would scream and holler for Johnny Cash, and he did good, real country music. But they were always waiting for Elvis Presley to come back. So there, within a period of year, we had uh, two unique, different, fresh, new stylists. And even though the Presley had come along, and a lot of the artists at that time ab said absolutely destroyed the hayride, nobody wanted to follow him, see, because of the great, tremendous response and the style that he did, and the difference of the age group become younger and the people that started coming, see. And then uh, just a year later, here comes Johnny Cash with basically the same instrumentation but a different, different approach. So there's two within a year that started right there on the hayride. It, it's, it's, a, it's quite unique. And willow how to cry. And I showed the clouds how to cover up a clear blue sky. And the tears that I cried for that woman are gonna flood you, big river. And I'm gonna sit right here until I die. By the summer of 1956, Johnny Cash was gone too. Song that I've heard lately, some fellow gets shot, and his baby and his best friend won't die with, as likely as not. Bob Lumen was one of several rockers that tried the Hayride stage. It became a rockabilly showcase, but there was still room on stage for a good honky tonk singer. The music from the honky tonk, the lonely songs they play. George stayed for a few years, then went to Nashville and became a major star in the mid-60s. The hayride continued for a while without a real big name on the show. A lot was blamed on Elvis and the changing tastes of the public. There were no new country stars being formed, built, because they were all singing uh, Elvis style. The, the change it did with the hayride or whatever happened there happened with the music business and the entire country music business. It all, we had to all change. I came and moved to Nashville in 1957. I recorded a song and was lucky enough to get on those same pop charts that, that he was dominating. I didn't go up very far, but I, I got on the pop charts. So I made us uh, try harder and try something different. The hayride fans turned their attention to those performers who were good but just weren't famous. There were dozens of them. Known as the rest of the Hayride Gang, folks like Leon Payne, Buddy Attaway, Betty Amos, James O'Gwen, and Margie Singleton. They were part of the Hayride too, and it was their turn to carry the show. I mean, to me, I don't care whether you're Van Givens or who was in you know, a local dish jockey done some work on the Hayride, or whether you were Elvis Presley. You still had that one thing, you were hayride. And to me, one was as important as the other. One of the hayride regulars since the early days always seemed to be just around the corner from making it big. He had one hit called Honky Tonk Man that hit the top 10, but he just kept smiling, waiting his turn. Success was never the driving force for Johnny Horton. That's why they called him 
the singing fisherman. Well, over on the lake in a tiny little boat stood a tall, slim gal who said a boat wasn't slow. She called on me for a helping hand and said I didn't have time. I'm a fishing man. I'm a fishing man. He was uh, more like a sportsman. He'd rather fish and hunt and uh, do things like that there. And singing was a means of way to get money for him to buy fishing baits with. <laughs> really, he'd put all his fishing equipment in the trunk of the car and sometimes wouldn't hardly have room enough for his guitar. And if he'd start see a pond along the way, he just might stop and go fishing even if he was going to be late. <laughs> but he loved to do it. That was his life, you know. The big time caught up with Johnny when he recorded a song that Tillman heard on Nashville radio. It was different from the honky-tonk style Johnny was known for. The record turned out to be a classic. But the Battle of New Orleans was just one of those special tunes that comes along every now and then. It went number one all over the country and made Johnny Horton Shreveport's favorite son. He followed it up with other big hits like North to Alaska, but he still liked coming home and playing the hayride. On November 5th, 1960, Johnny died while traveling between show days. When he was he was killed, we had played in Austin, Texas at a club called the Skyline Club. And we left there about one o'clock, and I guess it was about two uh, when he was, uh, the boy hit us on the bridge as we was going around the bridge there. I was in the front seat, and my head was laying against his shoulder, and I just remember Johnny fighting the steering wheel when the boy hit us. And of course, I went out too. I got this scarf on top of my head there, and Tommy Thompson lost his leg. He was in the back seat. And by the time we got to the hospital, Johnny was dead, and I was unconscious good while myself. For a long time, I, it was hard for me to accept the fact that he was gone, you know. By the time Johnny Horton died, the Louisiana Hayride was no longer a weekly show at the Municipal Auditorium in Shreveport. The show lost its spot on the CBS network. Rising costs put a strain on the Hayride's profits. And then there was the new competition from television. We found when crowds diminished and we didn't have the big stars, that the only way to keep going was to bring a star in. And then we, we had to change our entire way of doing things. We had to pay them what they wanted instead of, you know, th them taking what we were giving. And uh, one thing led to another. We went from a every Saturday night to a twice a month and then to a once a month and then finally the end. It was just like a death of a type. I mean, I've seen people leave, you know, like their job or something. It's not the same thing. It's something that they knew was a unique in that time and place. It would never be the same again, couldn't be. And it's a big chunk out of your life. If the plans had been made for extensive booking of the people that we had, uh, if there had been recording studios to keep side musicians busy, if publishing houses had been set up, if all of those things had been uh, set up at that time, perhaps the ride would have survived and be as big as Nashville is today. Of course, I understand the Hayride is still operating uh, uh, over in Bossier City, I, I think. But it's a different situation, different setup uh, than it was when, uh, when KWKH uh, had the Louisiana Hayride, and the Louisiana Hayride was the show in that section of the country. In 
In 1974, Shreveport businessman David Kent bought the Hayride name from KWKH and started a weekly show in a new building outside of Shreveport. It seems old legends die hard, especially in country music. There's a mystique about the Louisiana Hayride. They come here almost as if it is to a shrine. And well, they know that uh, 23 of the stars and superstars of country music started here, and uh, they are proud to be a part of that. Uh, I don't uh, underestimate it at all. I'm very conscious of it, but exactly why it has this effect on them, I don't know. I guess it's sort of, to a religious person, it would be like uh, visiting the Holy Land. It's almost that way. When you think about it, the old Louisiana Hayride was a fast-moving stream that fed the big river of country music. It lives on in the music of the people that played there and in the hearts of the folks who listened and yelled for more. At the time of the Hayride, we were having a good time. We really were not aware that we were making country music history. It was a lot of fun, and I don't think we really took anything very serious. Uh, well, at 19 years old, there's not many of us that do take things so serious. <laughs> the fun and the relationship that all of us had on the Louisiana Hayride was a family-type relationship, and uh, I never will forget it, and I'm thankful that I was here at the right place at the right time to be able to participate in something as great as the yeah. Louisiana Hayride. It was a, it was a wonderful feeling. It was something that you never forget. So here I am, 50 albums later, wanting to go back to Shreveport. <laughs> Work the Louisiana A ride one more time. Get the old gang together. Wouldn't that be fun? That'd be great. invite folks all over this great United States of ours to come down where Saturday night is good country music, the Louisiana Hayride. Good night to you, Norm. Thank you very much, Baron. And folks, next week we plan to have the famous gospel singers, the Chuck Wagon Gang. Hope you'll plan to tune in your favorite CBS radio network station. Our thanks tonight to Bob Shelton and Baron Young, and of course to all the rest of the gang. I'd like to close with a term used by the late Hank Williams when he had a program on KWKH. If the good Lord's willing and the creeks don't rise, we'll see you next week. Until then, this is Norm Bale speaking for Jeff Dale, saying the best of luck to you and good night, everybody. Thrill Suspense comes tomorrow on the CBS Radio Network.